Good afternoon and welcome to Staff Chat. We're so glad that you have joined us today. Um, it is the second week of school and so we thought nothing could be more fun than for us to talk about our experience as being a student in elementary and middle and high school and um, we want to just gather the family around if you can and let's have some fun uh, talking about what school is like for all of us. So I'm going to ask you guys some questions. So the first one I want to know is what kind of student were you in elementary school and what was your favorite teacher or who was your favorite teacher and why? I'll go first, Jenny. I grew up in Memphis and most of you know I'm a twin, have a twin brother and our, in the first grade, uh, I was a great student. I turned in all my homework, but our, the two twins had the exact same homework turned in every time and one of them was copying off his brothers. And I don't know whether it's my brother copying off me or, but he is a hospital president and I'm where I'm at. So uh, that was the only year that we were in the same class together. And so from then on out, we were in the same school, but they did, he did make straight A's all through school. And I made about as many C's as I made A's and hopefully made a few B's in the way too. But uh, I enjoyed school, I enjoyed being with people and enjoyed recess was my favorite favorite subject that I took. And so we had a great playground at my uh, elementary school. And uh, in Memphis, we went, I went to the same school first through 12th grade. And uh, they had an elementary building, a middle school, really junior high building back then, and a senior high. So I just went from one building to another on the same big property. So I enjoyed my school. Great. So Jeannie, I'm happy to go next. Um, I. Uh... I'm also a twin, and so uh, I had an interesting school experience as well, Don. Um, so my twin is extremely outgoing, extremely extroverted. So I actually was very quiet growing up. Uh, if if I needed to say something, William would answer for me. So you know, I I never felt like I needed to say anything. Um, so uh, for that reason, uh, one of my favorite subjects was reading because it meant that everyone was quiet and everyone you know would actually stop talking. Um, and then, um, uh, other than that, of course, I loved choir and my, um, you know, my favorite teacher um, was probably my choir teacher for that reason, too. I was pretty social in elementary school, too. I think it was second grade. I was constantly trying to talk to whoever was behind me. And uh, I remember the teacher saying, Jimmy, you need to keep your eyes on the board. And so to give you some idea what kind of student I was, I actually got up and walked up to the blackboard and put my face Again, that was I was literally keeping my eyes on the board. So Deborah Phillips may remember that. She was probably in my class. She, she probably could testify that that's that's true. Um, anyway, my favorite teacher was my fourth grade teacher, uh, Mrs. Doss. I didn't realize until I started at uh, First Baptist uh, that was Calvin Doss's wife, Ruth. Uh, she was uh, really kept us challenged and kept the class moving forward, kept me focused. So uh, she she would have been my favorite. I guess I can go. Unless, or Jane, you were wanting to go. It's okay. Go ahead. Um, I I was in band all the way through middle school, all the way through high school, and to me, I I think that was probably one of my favorite classes. We also like to goof around a little bit too because we, I was on the drum line and we knew our stuff and so the drum line could kind of act the fool a little bit and no one really cared as much because we were always on point I'm just saying and our band director was very patient with us and he would allow us to be a little bit silly and goofy but also like know that we're not causing trouble um, but but having him was was he was probably my favorite teacher because he put up with a lot of us and a lot from us uh, but it was a good experience, and I think we all were better for it. But that's been my experience. Well, I loved school, and um, I was a good student, and I was the one that when um, the teacher would have to leave the room, you know, I was put in charge of watching out for the Jim Baldwins in the room to make sure that they didn't tear the place down and all that. And um, So uh, I guess, I don't know, I, had, I have a lot of favorite teachers. Um, Ms. Teufel, like, she was my sixth grade teacher, but she would teach us Peter, Paul, and Mary songs and Simon and Garfunkel songs, and we were just always doing these little musicals and stuff like that, but um, my favorite teacher was Mrs. Garofalo because she was my social studies teacher, and I didn't really like social studies, but she was great, and she would always pull me out of class, other classes, 
to come and teach me how to play backgammon or teach me to how to do the New York Times crossword puzzle. And so I just thought she was awesome. So she was the best. That's cool, Jane. So I have remarked, uh, I think in our last staff chat, I remarked about being a bit mischievous and I was never a stellar student. But I remember when I was in first grade, my brother and I were out in the front yard throwing rocks at cars as they were passing along the street. They were just small rocks and I happened to hit a first grade teacher's car with a rock. And uh, so it was early in the school year. Uh, I did not excel going forward that that year. Well, when I was in the third grade, I remember my teacher, my teacher informed me that she was also my mother's teacher when my mother was in third grade. And I remember saying, gosh, you must really be old. I didn't really excel well that year either. And then I remember when I was in the sixth grade, uh, my dad knew my teacher. He knew her well. And by sixth grade, you know, I was already getting into stuff and had a pretty good reputation for not being a stellar student. And so he said to her when he dropped me off that day, first day at school, now if he gets out of line, you just go ahead and wear him out and you call me and let me know and I'll wear him out when he gets home. Well, <laughs> she took that, she took that seriously. And so <laughs> she and my dad were good friends. And as it turned out, she's actually Ann Brown, who sings in our choir as a soprano. It's Ann's sister. And Miss Evans was she was wonderful. She, her and her husband had a pig farm. And so usually Monday through Friday, I might get worn out three or four times that week. But on Friday, she'd always let me and a couple of other boys go home with her for the weekend, feed the pigs and play on the farm and stuff like that. I guess she was my favorite teacher. <laughs> well, I was a very serious student. Um, that probably doesn't surprise anyone, but my goal was to always have my paper turned in first before anyone else and that it would be perfect. <laughs> and um, my favorite role was to do anything that like allowed me to go to the office to be the special helper or grade papers or um, assist or help or whatever. So um, I, I was always the teacher's pet. Um, pretty much. Um, so my favorite teacher, I had lots of favorites, but um, in elementary school, my favorite teacher was my fifth grade teacher, Miss Jacobs. And she had this huge system. Um, it was like a big chart up on the wall of we would be put in groups every Monday. And I guess they would go for two weeks or so. You're in this collective group and we got to make a name for our team. And then we could earn points for being the fastest or the best or the most clean or the most efficient or the best communicators or whatever, doing the most spectacular project. And so it rewarded um, effort. And so at the end of those two weeks, she would take the winning team on these amazing um, like adventures. Like she would take us to putt putt golf or to go get ice cream or whatever. And at the end of the year, the the five people that had been on the most winning teams throughout the year got to go to the Sundial restaurant in Atlanta. Um, with her and um and so it, like what an amazing thing she knew my love language and spoke it well so i could just achieve <laughs> well I, I assume the staff is is going to find this probably hard to believe but i was extremely studious uh, as as a youngster uh, yes ma'am no ma'am all that kind of stuff and uh, you know i enjoyed school loved being in school um uh, I, I like to talk at, at an early age, so I, I got in trouble for that occasionally. But, but um, you know, I just, I just loved going to school, being a part of school, and, and just, just all that kind of stuff. And um, uh, my fourth grade math teacher, Ms. Lawson, um, she uh, came up with these little math games that we'd play. We'd have to go up to the board, and it'd be timed, and you'd have competition one-on-one. -on -one. I just remember just falling in love with that because I wanted to win, and I wanted to do something great. And, and I just love making her happy too. And so, you know, that was just so, so exciting for me. And, and I know, again, calm down staff, I don't want anybody to have a heart attack, but, but my senior superlative was Mr. Courteous. That's awesome, John. <laughs> what happened? What happened? <laughs> Come That's on. really funny, John. I'll go next. Um, 
I, my, my school experience was kind of a, I guess kind of a strange one. I, I spent time kind of in and out of a bunch of different schools, um, public school, a little bit of homeschooling, back to public school, private school, back to public school. But um, one of the reasons for that is, uh, you know, studies were never an issue for me. It was really, I think, more like the social side of things. In elementary school, uh, I'm telling this story, no matter where they dropped me off for a long time, whether it was like daycare at church or going to school or whatever it was, I would always do the same thing. I, I wouldn't talk to anybody. I'd go straight to the corner. I know it sounds super creepy, but I just sit in the corner and I'd watch people and um, did that for many years. And I was blessed to have some teachers along the way that were really good about that and just understood that's just kind of how I operated. And, uh, you know, a few times I remember, you know, teachers or whoever coming up to me and being like, John, are you doing okay over here? And my response is always the same. I'm just watching people. And um, so I know that sounds really weird, but middle school hit and uh, all of a sudden, you know, middle school equals, you know, figure out social cues and stuff, which I kind of fumbled through a little bit uh, and kind of made it work. But I also uh, fell in love with band during middle school and um, played the trumpet and found that I kind of had a knack for that. And, and so that really kind of held things together for me, weirdly enough, um, really kind of helped me break out of, you know, my shell a bit and, um, you know, did band through all the way through middle school, did band all the way through high school until my senior year where I switched to chorus. Um, and that was kind of it. Yeah. I, and as far as like studies go or like stories, um, like I said, I, I was just kind of was a good student. I knew it was what I needed to do. And so I just kind of did it, but the socialization aspect was definitely the harder part of my, my school. Thanks, John. I think everybody, I, I, um, I'll go. So I, I don't remember elementary school, y'all. I've been like racking my brain trying to figure it out. I remember parts of middle school, but I don't remember elementary school. So I think I liked school. I don't know. Um, I, I didn't love high school. I just, I didn't love the study part. I loved the social part, but I didn't love the study part of high school. But I did have a teacher in the ninth grade. Um, her name was Mrs. Horn. She was an advanced English teacher, and she was known as the hardest teacher in the school, but I absolutely loved her. She set clear boundaries, like you knew how to achieve and what to do, and you had to work hard. And I really liked English grammar, like that whole dissecting, dissecting sentences and all the grammar pieces of English. I just loved doing that. And so that's probably, um, I'm sure I have some elementary school memories back in there somewhere, but I just don't remember what they are. So, um, okay, our next question is gonna be this. Um, what piece of advice would you give to parents of students, kids and students now? I have one thing that uh, I know our kids right now in this moment, a lot of them are spending more time online with their schoolwork. I would say to parents and families of young kids or to teenagers, or whatever, to find something fun to do as a family during this time, especially with the way school is going, because the conversations I'm having with teenagers, they are not enjoying online school <laughs> at all. <laughs> and it's kind of frustrating to hear, or sorry, I can hear their frustration in that. And what I hear when I, when they say that is, I really need to just do something. So my point of advice would be to just go do something as a family. And I know even that is limited because we can't just go and do like we would five months ago. So we have to keep all that in mind as well. Maybe it's a board game night. Maybe it's a, I don't know, a movie night or something that your family does that just your family does uh, and find something like that to do because I think that's helpful because they don't have recess like they did. They don't have all the outlets that they did with gym or weightlifting or whatever that they were doing in high school or whatever. I would say that'd be helpful, but that's just me. Yeah, I, I've, my mom was a teacher. My wife's a teacher. My daughter's a teacher. You know, for me, I, I think one of the advices that I would give is, is try to love on your children's teachers. You know, don't, don't just look at the process of, of they're just fulfilling a job, uh, which they are, but also the reality that they're human beings and, and it's tough for them too. And to, to try to love on them and encourage them and grace them and bless them. 
I think that model is a great example for your children, uh, how to deal with children, especially if there might be some tension or some conflict there. It's a, it's a great way for them to get sort of an early view of that and, and to know the parents, you know, are going to be fair and, and loving and graceful. And that, that's just a, a great thing. And so I just in, encourage moms and dads to try to love up those teachers and, 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 and treat them uh, with the respect that they deserve for, for the crazy hard work that they do. So I can go next. Um, first of all, I don't have kids, so I don't know if I'm really qualified to give any advice to parents. Um, so the one thing I did think about is like, okay, what what would I have said when I was a child, you know, that I wish had been done for me? And like I said, I grew up in a very loud home. And so for me, it wasn't it wasn't that I wanted people to encourage me to talk more. I just wanted people to listen to me when I actually did. And so for parents or maybe even for teachers, you know, find that person, find that child that maybe doesn't speak up as much and, and don't try to pressure them to talk more, but try to create environments where they feel comfortable enough to say something. Yeah, I'm going to jump on there with you, Stephen. I think it's important that you listen to your children. Listen, recognize your children uh, that are, you know, all children are not the same, you know, and even if you have multiple children there in your home, um, they have their strengths and they have their weaknesses and you need to make sure that you listen you know, to all your kids, try to have time with your kids one-on-one, -on -one. you know, give them some specific time that, where they get your attention, your heart, your interests, and uh, try to, to plan some family meals together. One of the things that we used to do is, you know, we would try to have dinner together. I mean, our world was crazy back then too. But try to have dinner together. And we would ask the kids, what's the best thing that happened for you today? And what's the worst thing that happened for you today? And listen to them, you know, the, the things that they felt good about, the things that, that, that they struggled with. And so, uh, you know, we'd, and we'd address those, those things with, with honesty and, um, that's my advice to parents. I, I was just going to say, you know, um, often when I uh, talk with my kids now that they're grown, you know, the things that I try hard to orchestrate, they don't even remember in the moments that were just us being present together are the things that stick with them. So I would just really encourage parents, this is a, an uncharted time. Don't try to put a lot of expectations on yourself of what it's supposed to look like. Just be as present as you can and um, give grace to yourself and each other. And there will be beautiful moments that will come out of this and just um, try to let them, let them come as they will come. Uh, I remember growing up, uh, I, I don't remember ever my mother and father sitting down with me and helping me with my homework. And we were sort of on our own. And, and you know, like I said, my brother, we had four boys in our family and, and uh, we, we were just had to, learn to do it on our own I guess and but then you know when I but we did a lot of stuff together as a family we went camping a lot together we we never went out to eat we had supper breakfast lunch and supper every meal together and and when during the summer and breakfast and supper every night uh, so we had a great great time as a family but I know when I was uh raising my two boys up that we uh we didn't really do you know, sit down with them, do their homework, but I was a project man. I love doing projects, whether it's a science project or whether it's doing big posters and making it look flashy and just making butterfly collections. I was the best butterfly collection guy in the world. And, and so uh, we had a great time with me and my two boys just doing projects together and, and uh, stuff like that. Well, I guess I would, um, I wrote down a whole bunch of stuff because you know, like when you, when you come on the other side, like my son's 25 now, like he's grown and you think, oh man, I wish somebody had told me all these things. Uh, and Lynn Collins did tell me some of them. So that's great. But, you know, I think helping your kids love to learn is the most important thing, you know, not necessarily the academic thing, but whatever it is that gives them passion and whether it's Legos or cooking or gardening or whatever, whatever it is, but just helping them ask them questions, give them that inquisitive space. I love that. And um, I think the other piece of advice I would give is let them leave their book at school and like forget their book and have to deal with it. 
and you know let them not you know miss a deadline on a project because they procrastinated um, I didn't do that I wish I had done that um, we didn't have very many opportunities you know but we I did have some and so I wish that I had been a little bit better about that to you know let him have some natural consequences of what it means to not always get it right um, and then to remember that it's not about building the resume for college you know that college is available for everybody and it may not be Harvard or your dream school but college is available for everybody and so um, life is more important because it goes back so quick than the resume you're going to build for college and so I think those are pieces of advice um, that I would give to our parents and to breathe just breathe <laughs> Jeannie, you stole a little bit of my thunder because I was going to say my parents did a lot of really great things um, with me, I think. And looking back on it, I'm really grateful for the way they did some of those things. But one of the biggest ones was they were all about natural consequences and letting the chips fall as, as we had set them up to fall, so to speak. Um, and by operating that way, it taught us to be responsible, I think, me and my two brothers. But it also allowed them to have moments to really show us grace. You know, it's not like they always let us, you know, figure things out on our own, um, you know, and, and when they did show, when they did show grace, they came in and they always explained that, you know, we're not going to let you fall on this because God doesn't let you fall. And it was really just an, a, a great teaching moment, a uh, really great, you know, parental gospel teaching moment. And I'd say that's kind of the second thing would be, you know, my parents were always talking about what you know, what Jesus had done for them, what Jesus was doing in their life. It was just a part of our normal everyday conversation. And they just kind of allowed moments um, to kind of come up in the life of our family to talk about those things. And so, you know, that's, that's something that's really stuck with me through the years about, um, about how I was raised and something that I really appreciate a lot. John, I love that you said that. I, I never will forget, it was kind of senior year, and I can remember exactly where we were. We were near the Krispy Kreme, and, you know, we didn't have opportunities to be in the car very often because he had his own car and he drove, and, you know, that changes all dynamics. But we were in the car together going somewhere, and I just remember having this overwhelming sense of, I don't know if he understands grace. I don't know if he's had enough, enough opportunities in life to really grasp grace. And just feeling like I had a short time before college was about to happen to, um, just make sure that he knew that. And so I, I love that what you said, John. Anybody else? It's me. And <laughs> um, I feel like, thank you. I need all this advice. I mean, I'm, I'm in the throes of the parenting phase, but um, I just want our parents to know that, um, that they can just be such an example to their children about what's important um, by the way that you structure your family, um, by the way that you prioritize um, your faith, just in everyday things like John was saying, um, in the way that you let some things just roll off and just let it go on by, that not everything is important. Um, and so I look back at my parents and the way that they really set that example for us. Um, I mean, we knew that there was just no question about where we were going to be on Sunday morning. We were going to be at church. Like that just was not, um, not a question because that was a, a high priority for our family. Um, but then I also knew that if I um, had a dream or a vision that they would try to help me in any way they could to try to make that happen. So when I wanted to create a stamp club, then stamp club it was. And so like whatever, you know, whatever um, the idea was, it wasn't always that they were going to make a giant financial investment or we were going to, you know, do some crazy thing but they were like let's let's give it a try if you want to let's give it a try and um and i think um how encouraging that was and so as i try to think i want to be more like my parents i'm like do i encourage my kids enough um to, to take on new adventures or or whatever um so i would challenge parents to do that but to also all the, that all of you have said that there is grace and so um at the end of the day when um you know all the kids are in bed and you have those moments where you think i really didn't do my best today um there is grace and um i think your kids will learn that 
I think to be honest and to say to them, you know, um, when, when as parents, when we've messed up, you know, I'm sorry, I lost my temper. I'm sorry. I didn't give it my best yesterday or, um, I'm sorry, I wasn't my best, um, that it models for them that they too can have off days and that we need to offer our kids a lot of grace, um, especially in times like these when, um, everything is out of sorts. And so when we can say to them, you know, you're allowed to mess up too, because certainly we do. And, um, as the adults, and so kids get even more messed up opportunities and more grace. And so I just hope in the end that they will recognize that, um, you know, that they are loved and beloved and um, precious children of God. Yeah, Rebecca, thanks for saying that because you know, sometimes we need to say to our parents, recognize there's, there's only ever been one perfect parent. That's our heavenly father and only one perfect child. And that's Jesus. And so we're, we're imperfect parents and we have imperfect children, uh, but God has blessed us with our children and, uh, kids, God has blessed your parents with you. Um, you, you. You take deep breaths, like Jeannie said. You hold on to each other. You hold on to your faith. And uh, and you you make it through this thing. You know, and, and as the children change, uh, and they do, uh, sometimes our parenting needs to change. And, uh, and we learn from each other. I agree, Jim. Thanks for saying that. You know, we Cutter and I used to do this little thing in the car. Um, someone very wise told me one time, um, you can't ever expect your teachers to pray with your and for your children if you are not willing to do that yourself um, every single day. And so that was a, very much a challenge to me to pray with him before school every day. And pretty much without fail, that was that was the one thing we did. And I would we would always say, "This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it." And I would just tell him, "You know, today is a new day. Whatever happened yesterday is yesterday, and we don't know about tomorrow. But today, God has given us a new day." Y'all, thank you. I, I hope this will be a little bit of it's been encouragement to me. I hope it'll be some encouragement to the folks that'll get to watch. And Becca, I have asked you to pray, but I feel like we need to be praying for you. But um, as our minister to children and families, I'm going to ask you to close us out in prayer, but just know that we do pray for you. Well, thanks. Let's pray. God, we just, um, we thank you for families. We thank you for each of the children and the families that you have placed them in. We pray for our parents and for all of our students, God, that you would just continue to allow them to, um, to encourage and look to you for um, for help in all of their days. God, as we um, have families who are experiencing life in new ways these days, we pray for extra patience and extra peace and extra grace. God, um, help us and all of our children um, always keep their eyes on you, knowing that you um, paved the way for how to live and how to love and the example that we have for forgiveness and mercy and um, all of the things that parents and kids need as they um, learn and grow together. God, we also pray for our teachers and for our schools and for our administrators as they are navigating new waters and figuring out all the best ways to serve our children. God, we know that um, as we continue to support um, schools and parents and teachers and kids that you care about them more than anyone else could. And so God, we just trust you and love you. And we thank you for all of your mercies that are new each day. Amen. Thank you, Becca. Everybody say bye. Bye, guys.